we've talked about the granite soils of Beaujolais. In truth, the soils are not all the same, and they're not all even granite for that matter. We'll see that there's a lot of different kinds of soils in Beaujolais, and each one of them, we think, has some impact upon why the wines taste as they do from that individual crew. So, very obviously a map of France. You can see where Burgundy is. You can see where Beaujolais is as well. But let's dig in and see now where the, the best spot of, of Burgundy is the Côte d'Or, and then Côte Chalonnais, then we see the Maconnais, and then finally Beaujolais. Now, the Maconnais is important to us here, certainly because it's a, a place that produces some very nice Chardonnay, but it's also important to understand that this is where the de Beauf family came from, that they lived in Chantre, and that he made Puy Fuissé and made Macon Chantre to sell to, most famously, Paul Blanc, the great restaurateur of Le Chapon Fin. And that's really what put de Beauf on the map. He went searching for very good red wines, and he went to the Beaujolais crew that we see here in order to find his very best wines and sell them to restaurateurs. And that's really how he got his start as a, as a great producer of wines. Now, each individual crew, in our view, has its own set of flavors. A lot of that is going to be at least described as coming from the soil. We will admit right off the bat that that is a controversial notion. It is also possible to say that each vine is growing in a different set of minerals and those minerals will have an impact upon the vine's growth cycle and that will have an impact upon the wine. So however we get there, we're gonna talk about minerals and we're gonna talk about subsoils when we talk about the Beaujolais Cru. We'll start in the north with Saint Amour. If it sounds like love, it is. It's lovely, it's gentle. This is a lighter style of uh, indeed of Beaujolais. And that's gonna produce, we think, um, a wine that probably doesn't live quite as long as, as some others. Now, part of this is because it's not a particularly warm site. It's a slightly cooler site. But part of it we think as well is because it's not so much of the granite, the decomposed granite that we talk about so much in Beaujolais Cru. This is more granite and clay mixed together. There's some shale, some pebbles, and it's a relatively small area. Next to it is Julianas. Julianas has definitely more of, of this granite, uh, along with some alluvial gray deposits. In the west, we see more of the granite. In the east, we see more of the alluvial uh, clay. It's named after Julius Caesar. We'll talk about this in a, in a little bit greater detail, but it does hark back to, to Roman times when we do think that uh, wine was being produced here. As we continue to move slightly south, now we look at Chenas. Chena is uh, certainly named after what were once very dense oak forests in this area. And now you can see a lot more of this uh, uh, granite, this pink granite, this gore that, that we talk about. And uh, that, that shallow granite uh, provides a slightly larger wine, a little more bone, boniness to it, but never as much as Moulin Avant. Um, here that pink granite uh, begins to dominate. We also have seams of manganese. And manganese isn't something that we can say has a, a direct impact upon the character of the wine, except that it's not a, a kind mineral when it comes to vine growth. So it stunts the vine growth. And, and our trick when we're trying to, to grow grapes is to make sure that the vine knows its job is not to grow a whole bunch of leaves, but to get to the process of, of creating progeny, of, of, of developing seed, i.e. growing grapes. So manganese actually helps keep Moulin Avon a, an area that produces uh, really, we think, fairly dense, fairly powerful, fairly if, uh, in, intense wines. And it's therefore one of the most famous of all the areas in, uh, in, in Beaujolais Cru. And certainly an area that has a lot of this gore and therefore is associated with long lived Beaujolais. Continuing south, Next, we find ourselves in, in Fleury. Now, Fleury, as you can see, has much of this gore, this pink granite as well. And yet Fleury, we don't think of as being quite as long lived as Moulin Avant and some of the areas down south. And the reason for that is, is it's not as exposed to the winds coming uh, down the river and, and up the river either way, but most of the time down the river. It's not as warm a site, it's not as ripe a, a site. It tends to be more floral, more flowery, um, a bit more delicate. Um, it is an extremely charming uh, uh, site uh, for wine, both from the, the a visual standpoint and certainly the wines themselves, but not as long lived typically. 
next door to that, just going south again, is Shahub. We see more of this kind of rough uh, gore, rough pink granite with some uh, flecks of, of quartz here and there. Um, it is a, uh, it, it's certainly a region that produces slightly bigger, slightly broader uh, Beaujolais alongside Fleury though. I would say it's, it's typically a, a kind of a middleweight uh, Beaujolais crew. Then the youngest of the crews, Renier. Renier is uh, a, 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 once again, um, sort of a middleweight when it comes to uh, the, the longevity of these kinds of wines and the power of these uh, kinds of wines. But it's also, I think, a very charming area. But it is our youngest. It's only been a crew for about 25 years or so. Finally, we get to the, the kind of the big bombers here, aside from Moulin Avant. Morgan is the one that many people think of as the most long lived, the most powerful, the most serious of, of the wines of Beaujolais and of the Beaujolais crew, particularly in this area down south at the bottom of this uh, picture you can see here of Cote de Pie. These wines are, yes, they are uh, complex. They can be big bone, they can be fairly tannic, but I think complexity and longevity is more their hallmark, more what, what separates them one from another, aside from the fact that you see quite a bit of this, uh, of, of this gore, of this pink granite. There's also a lot of crumbly schist through there, and it seems to add something slightly different to the wines. And then our last two Beaujolais crew, Beaujolais crew uh, that have particularly uh, big bones, able to live a long time, Rouilly. Rouilly is uh, an area with a lot of this uh, pink uh, granite. Unquestionably, we, we see um, certainly some, uh, as well, some of this diorite or some of the blue stone that people talk about. We'll also see some limestone and, and clay and things like that. So it's a bit of a mix. But uh, when you get into to some of the diorite, when you get into the pink granite, we expect this wine to live a long time. And then finally, Cote de Bruyne, so sort of the, the hill in the, in the middle here, and the, the vines that are there tend to produce wines, again, that are big bone, that are powerful, that have a lot of uh, granite underneath them and some of this diorite uh, soil as well as some shale. So that's a, that's a quick and, and easy tour through uh, the Beaujolais crew. Now it's time to taste some of these. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Hey, Doug, how are you? I'm good, man. It's good to see you. Great to see you, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's been uh, been too damn long, but at least we're, you know, having a glass of Beaujolais. And I think when I taste great wines of the world, it always seems like, it seems like this grape is really matched with this place. And for some reason, nobody can else do it anywhere else in the world as good as they can. And that's what I love about Beaujolais, is that this is, this is the place where this grape should be, even though it was technically banished there. Uh, it, it's really... It's really, that could have been the best thing that ever happened to the Gamay grape. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, is you look at it and it's really not so much winemaking, even though of course, carbonic maceration is relatively unique. I think it's still the process of fermentation. There's not a lot of big oak. It's not really high in alcohol. There's not a lot of manipulation. To me, there's a purity in other words to these wines too. That's the other thing I like too, is that this grape has enough on its own that it doesn't need all that. And then I think this is the other dynamic I like about this region too, is that You've got a region where you have some very affordable, very well-made wine, and then you've got some excellent wine. And if you look around uh, at, at very high quality, and most regions of the world, they're either really good at the really high end or really good at the low end. It's rare that you get people that are at both levels. And, and again, this is another thing about this region I like is that I can get very affordable wine, but I can actually get great wine now too out of the same region. It's, it's usually so much of these red fruits and they're really bright, fresh. They're 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 almost like they've just come right out of the uh, of the refrigerator, kind of fresh fruits. And so I, I love that fresh fruit component. Of course, we talk about a little bit of the of the kind of the banana and, and the bubble gum also. But there's 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 kind of a purity to it, a very very light spice. But this is definitely a, a fruity one. And, and I think when we look at other characteristics there, they're definitely much more in the background. So when we look at the other thing, whether it's spices or herbs or uh, any kind of, of, kind of non-fruit component. Um, I just really focus on, on the fruit here. And I just, I, I love a little bit of the florals here too. And I think those are the two things. I think fruit and I think floral, mostly when I, when I smell Beaujolais. When I'm, when I'm, I'm smelling Beaujolais Village, it seems like immediately it gets a little bit darker. It gets a little bit more towards kind of red plum. It gets a little bit more into kind of, uh, darker kind of cherry, it, it maybe not so much of the, of the raspberry and strawberry, much, much more kind of the little bit darker red fruit. 
And this is where I start to pick up a little bit more of that spice too. There's, a, there's just a wonderful little, uh, almost things like, like cardamom, that kind of thing that I think is really nice. A little bit more earth here also too. So maybe a little bit less fruity, a little bit more uh, complexity. But, but I like the depth of it. I like the, 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 the intensity to me is, is a, it's just a more intense wine. And I think that's the other thing I noticed too. We have a lot of wines where there's a lot of great winemaking, a lot of great intensity. Um, and yet uh, a wine like this, to me, there's not enough wines like this in the world that have this. I think this is kind of the niche. And I think this is why so much of the sommelier community and, and even chefs too have gone this direction because these are wines that to me are, are kind of overlooked um, uh, because maybe they're not as dramatic. And yet in many ways, they're much more practical. And, and I just, I'm just glad that, that not all the wines in the world are the same. And this is that category of say, more medium bodied red wines that, that really are balanced, that to me are, are a, a category that's been over the last 10 or 15 years been kind of underrepresented in the world of wine. Um, it's interesting because it's not necessarily darker in color. It's not necessarily higher in alcohol. It's not more intense in terms of, of say those characteristics, but now it seems to be more about a place than a grape. And I think the first, the Beaujolais and Beaujolais Village were all about the, the Gamay grape. This is now about a place where that Gamay grape gets to really kind of display part of its personality and kind of that place comes in also. And, and I love that in that uh, then it makes sense that we do call this blurry. We do, it, it makes sense that this is a delimited area. <laughs> um, now I'm thinking about a little bit heavier dishes. Now I'm thinking in terms of food, got a little bit more body, a little more structure here in this wine. So I can go that much further in terms of where I'm going to go with it uh, in terms of, of pairings. Marie, and I'm talking about how rich the nose is and how balanced it is. The thing that I like about this Fleury is that this wine's going to get better. I, I, I want to taste this wine in three years. I want to taste this wine maybe in five years. I mean, I, I think we came from an era where, you know, Milan Avant was the one Beaujolais you could age. It's like all the rest you need to drink right away. Uh, and, and now it's like, now you're tasting all these crews and go, not only are these really interesting, but these are ageable too. And I think that's the other thing that we'll see more in the future too, is already we hear these stories about tasting older Beaujolais. I don't think most people have done that. I think there's just a few people, and I think you're gonna see more and more people, particularly with the crews, aging them, and really kind of showcasing the fact that, yeah, this is a grape that's great when it's young, but particularly in this situation, from this place, maybe with a little bit more uh, winemaking involved, it can really last a long time, and, and I love that. Again, same thing, most grapes, either short-term or long-term, this has both. Thanks for watching. When we come back in our next episode, we're gonna be talking to a geologist who also happens to be a master sommelier. So join us. Mm -hmm.